chapter 10. It's been a few weeks. Uh, we've had a number of things from the 4th of July to some mission speakers, and so uh, I don't know about you, I've missed it. I've mi- I love just working through the scriptures together on Wednesday night. I love kind of the space where we try to take, you know, a chapter or often half a chapter right now because they're a little bit long and there's so much to cover in the midst of that. So I'm super excited to be back. Hope you are as well. Hope you brought a Bible. Hope you're there. If you didn't, Bible's in front of you. Grab one, page number on the screen. Uh, invite you to have it open, even if it's on an electronic device, if that works better for you. Just have it there where God would just meet you in the midst of that. If you're joining us online, it's just the same moment, in a, just invitation. Hey, this is a Bible study. We want you to be in the Bible with us. So we're inviting you to have that so that you would see what God would say to you and that you would be open for God just speaking it uh, into your life. We want to just ask God for help right now, just that he would take his word and make it just alive, make it connect right where you are. And so I'm going to lead in prayer as we do each time. Hey, pray as well. Ask God right now to show you what he has. Father, here we are. Excited to be back in the book of Acts on Wednesday night, just asking for favor and help tonight. God, it's your word, and you work in such powerful ways through it. Please do that tonight. Please make yourself just heard in the midst of your word so that we see it, but your voice would resound through it. God, that you'd work in a way that would speak to our hearts individually. We'll know. We'll know that you're talking to us. I want anything that would just make that not happen tonight. Would you push it out of the way? Would you strengthen? Would you breathe life? Would you breathe help? And show us what you have for us. We ask for that right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In any given moment, there's so many stories. In any given moment of time, God is working, and sometimes it's amazing for me to consider the levels at which he works. I mean, he's working in such huge things and big things and things that, you know, are are movements of all of history. Then he's working in everybody's life individually at the same moment. He's moving in the midst of groups and families and churches. And I mean, it's an amazing thing to find yourself sometimes looking at it and recognizing we couldn't even begin to count the number of layers that are happening at any moment. But our God does. And he's working in all of that. Well, I open that way a little bit this evening because we get a small glimpse of just a few of those layers here this evening. Yeah, we're in Acts chapter 10. And in the midst of it, we begin to look at a story, but what's kind of fun in some ways is in some ways it's three stories. We're we're going to look at at least three different stories that are happening in the midst of this. We're going to look at the story of what God is doing in the midst of his church, how Jesus is building his church. We're going to look at a man named Cornelius, and we're going to see just what God is doing in his salvation. And then we're going to look at Peter and how he's being directed at the same moment to walk in the things that God has for him. Now, I want to tell you, it's kind of a fun thing to think about all these happening at the same time, but just my personality, I mean, if it was just like me, I would probably grab hold of one of these and like, hey, we're just going to track like, you know, Cornelius, and then we'll come back next week and track Peter. But I have a sense that there's a reason that it's just laid out this way, so that for all of chapter 10 and all of chapter 11, we are very specifically looking at these three stories Uh, that are happening at the same moment, watching the big things that God is doing, watching how he's directing, how he's drawing, and somehow in the midst of it, just even recognizing that becomes helpful. So we're going to approach it that way this evening, and so because we're going to cover all three stories, we're just going to make it through about half the chapter, Uh, then we'll continue it next week, and then continue into chapter 11, Uh, and so it'll begin to kind of weave its way together, but hoping in the midst of that, that God will meet you in this story, but reminding us, hey, what we get to see there, it's so true even today. God's working on so many levels. (laughs) He actually is. And and, and to think about what he's doing in the big pictures and what he's doing in individual lives and how he's saving people, it's things that we long to see happen in this moment, wanting to be a part of what he has. And so, by God's grace, that's where we want to begin. 
So we think about it here, and I tell you, in one sense, part of the story that's happening here in Acts chapter 10 is a reminder that Jesus is building his church. Yeah, that's a promise. That's a promise that Jesus told us, that he would be building his church. And don't miss this. That's a big part of our understanding. As we're here in the book of Acts, that's what we've kind of challenged you with every week. I've given kind of a title uh, to our study in the book of Acts, which is what Jesus is continuing to do through the Holy Spirit, through his church. It's how it begins in Acts chapter 1, saying that, that what Jesus started, now he's in many ways continuing, and that's true. Part of what we're getting a chance to see in the book of Acts is, is Jesus doing exactly what he said he would do, that he would build his church. Think about that promise given in Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus just simply said, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And that's true here in the book of Acts, and that's true here in 2023. Jesus is faithful. He is faithful, and he's saying, hey, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to keep doing this to the end, that Hades, hell is not going to prevail He's going to be building his entire work in the midst of it, and we're getting a chance to see that. Now, one of the ways we get to observe this happening is realize not only is he doing this, not only is it his work that, that he's unfolding, that he's unpacking, he's doing it exactly the way he said he would do it, exactly the way he called us to do it. Yet yeah, one of the interesting patterns that we watch happen in the book of Acts is fulfilling what Jesus promised. So many of you guys know it, Acts 1.8. If there's a verse that is familiar for many in the book of Acts, it is this verse where he simply tells us, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. So Jesus gives instructions, says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm, going to, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit, and you're going to take this gospel. It's going to happen in Jer Jerusalem, beginning there in that city, then to the surrounding uh, parts of, of, of Israel there in Judea, eventually to Samaria, and then to the ends of the world. One of the fun things realizing is that's exactly how the book of Acts has been progressing. God pours out his Spirit in Acts 2, and at Pentecost, 3,000 people are saved. I mean, it's this amazing moment. It begins to surround it. They go to the surrounding region. And then you kind of watch the story, if you remember. Um, in some ways, there's some comfortability there. There's some spaces that it hasn't actually, you know, moved further. And yet then God pushes that envelope. You know, God pushes that envelope. And, you know, the Samaritans get saved. Uh, and, you know, it ends up just, you know, down there with, you know, Philip preaching to him. Peter and John finally go down there and go, wow. Okay, I guess, I guess it's actually happening. The, the church is moving. I mean, we just, you know, we expanded. And now we are in Acts 10, and we're, Acts 10, and we're about to see the next pushing of the envelope. Uh, we're about to see, you know, this church, this glorious gospel, move from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and we're about to begin to see Gentiles get saved. Hasn't happened yet. I mean, it hasn't really been a part of the, of the story. It's about to become the main story. I mean, much of the rest of the book of Acts is going to watch the church explode uh, throughout the, the Gentile world, and, and which obviously is where you and I are here, and yet that's where we are. We're about to watch God move that forward, and it's worth just kind of noting that as we think about, you know, what that looks like. It's worth just thinking about how that happens and, and thinking about how that begins to unpack and just this place where that Gentile stage happens. But one of the things that has been one of the things I've told you, and I'd like to tell you again now as we're here, I just want you to observe who's doing it. I just want you to think about as we we're going to walk through this chapter this, e this evening, Who's moving this forward? Who's the one that's making it happen? And end of story, quick answer, it's God. I mean, this is God's doing. He's going to draw Cornelius. He's going to send Peter. It's God doing it. In fact, it's one of those amazing things because it's not happening through um, people. It's not happening. It's not like the apostles all get together in Jerusalem and kind of pull out a map and like, okay, so where's our next you know, campaign going to be now, you know, like, okay, so we've done Samaria, is it time, you know, and it, that nobody's planned this, nobody's, in fact, they're kind of in some ways comfortable, and yet God is doing that, he's going to, he's going to push that envelope, he's going to press it into the next, the next layer that's going to explode into the midst of that, and that's a fun thing to watch, because one of the things we become convinced of, or should 
become convinced of is the glorious work that God is doing, God is doing. I mean, it was, it's true in the book of Acts, and if I can quickly just tell you whether you recognize it or not, it is true in 2023. Where the church is moving forward today, where we are seeing things happen, God is doing it. Uh, sometimes, you know, we, it catches us off, off guard or out of, out of space. That's great because that's what we want. And in some ways, it draws us back into that space of saying, hey, that's what we want more of. That part of our problem sometimes as Christians is we have kind of wrestled control back over into our own care and thinking, hey, it's up to us. Like, we have to plan it. We have to make it happen. We have to be the strength of it. And that's always weakness. Instead of coming and saying, God, what are you doing? Like, how do we keep up with you? Like, what are you, what are you doing right now? We want to be on the same page as you. And, and that's really a place that God would invite just the church as a whole, but you individually. That in many ways, what God would invite you to be a part of is saying, God, show me what you're doing and then help me keep up with you. Like, what do you want me to join you in what you're laying out before me? Because I want to see that happen. And sometimes it would be things that you have no idea how big it is. This is certainly one of those stories where we get to watch this happen. So again, it's kind of just this fun thing that nobody else was probably recognizing this at that moment. I mean, probably later they'd look back and go, huh, yeah. So Jesus said, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, end of the world. Kind of crazy. I guess that's what we're into now. I guess that's what we're after. You know, I guess that's what we're doing. But God knows it. God's been doing it, and he's been doing it at the right time and the right way. And so I'm just inviting you to begin, you know, kind of that process of watching all of this happen and realize that God himself is doing that, and he still is. He still is. Well, that's good news. That's good news for us. And with that, now we switch over from that story, though it's certainly still a part of it, and we want to meet a man uh, that, who is going to be instrumental or be a big part of the story, Cornelius. Why don't you notice it with me in verse 1 of chapter 10. It says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion, of what was called the Italian Regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all of his household, who gave alms generously to the people, and he prayed to God always. Hey, pause there. That's a good space for us to begin, and I want you just to think through it with me for a moment. Here we have a man who is, it tells us, he fears God. He's a fearer, a God-fearer in the midst of that. He's one that walks in this, and there's a few things we can just put together in the midst of these spaces. It's, again, a reminder. He's a Gentile. He's a Gentile. That's the kind of the point. I mean, God's about to take that gospel and move it into the Gentile world. He's a Gentile. He's in the Italian regiment, probably from you know, Rome itself in the many ways. Much of what we kind of hear or read in other spaces uh, around that space, this is a very honored one of the spaces, and he's a centurion. That means he's over 100 men. He's over 100 men. A centurion then uh, would be a part of, as it tells us there, that he's a part of the Italian regiment. Um, and, and, and so, you know, a regiment there would be about 600 men. So you'd have, you know, kind of have your, your centurion over, over his men, then you have a regiment. That would be a part of a legion. That would be 10 of those. And so 6,000 men in the midst of that. And so he's placed here in Israel. He's been brought here, conscripted here, you know, from Rome, placed in this place, over 100 men. And yet it's a fascinating story. Interesting enough, for whatever it's worth, the Bible has an interesting thing that most of the spaces where we see centurions mentioned, it's mentioned with incredible honor. They turn out to be men of character, uh, men who, who, in many ways, God can work in the midst of. For some of you, kind of military background, some would say, well, you'd almost think about a centurion like a master sergeant kind of a thing, you know, someone who's, you know, got this role influencing, he's not there over everything, but he's a man who's in the midst of that, and here he is. So I try to find myself imagining that. Again, there's so much of the story we don't know. Whether he was, whether this was something he chose or he was conscripted by Rome into it, but somehow he's been placed here in Israel. This man, this Gentile, who was, who was placed there in the midst of that, and somehow he comes to believe in God. Now, we have no idea how it happened, but I just, I tend to like to have a, a fun imagination. Just so imagine it for a moment. 
I mean, so he grows up probably, you know, there in Rome, and he grows up in the pantheon of, of so many Roman religions, the, the religions of worshiping even Caesar, worshiping so many things, and somehow he's placed here in Israel. He's placed there in the midst of God's people, and something happens. Something happens. Uh, something happens where he comes to recognize, hey, this is God. Like, this is the real God. I mean, this is a God, he, he, he's, he's not, you know, all these other things, these idols that I've known or things that I grew up with or what my world is, somehow he came to believe that God, the God of Israel is actually God. And, and it tells us what he does. It gives us a few terms. It says he fears God, that he recognizes him, that he's reverent, that there's something about his very character that is seeking to live in response to that. He's giving alms. I mean, he is praying. I mean, he's not even here. Somebody who sees it and begins to engage his life around who God is. Again, just noticing what it tells us so you can see it there in verse 2. He's a devout man, one who feared God in fact, his whole household, they gave alms generously to the people. I mean, they're just you know, stepping into these good works, walking in this. They're praying. They are praying to God always. In fact, his whole household is doing that with him. Now, again, just because I'm just tossing it out to you, I just have questions. How did that happen? I mean, so was it him? I mean, did he have some encounter? Did he come to believe and then he influenced his family? Or was it the other way around? Was it maybe his wife or something that has some encounter and she, you know, brings it in home and then pretty soon they begin, you know, kind of setting up times where they, they pray and worship and they begin inviting their servants. They begin, you know, tells us about one of his soldiers in a few moments that's going to be also a, a fear of God who's going to be in the midst of that. So somehow it just develops here where they are. They're in this space where not only do they believe, but their belief has become something that others are doing. It's changing their world. Their whole world at this moment is this. And so here he is. I mean, it's just fun to kind of think through, I wonder how that happened. I mean, I wonder what happened that brought him to this moment. I don't know what it was, but I'm certain it was a number of things. I love to think about what God did in the midst of that, how God orchestrated these things to put this man in this moment in that space, and that's a great place. But let's also be clear. In fact, this might or might not be helpful. I hope not troubling. But right now, he is what we would call a seeker. It's not as much of a term that's used today. It's definitely been used in church history right now because let's just be clear. He's not saved yet. He doesn't know Jesus. He's not born again. Uh, he doesn't have that in, in the midst of that. That's about what's going to happen. He's about to get saved. He's about to have the gospel preached to him, and this man is going to become a follower of Jesus, and he's going to be the beginning of this whole movement, and that's fun to watch and kind of fun to think through, but at the same moment, it's also helpful for us to promise, uh, to helpful for us to think through how God works in the midst of that, how that would happen in, in this space. Again, it's not actually a term uh, that is used as much in our world today. Lots of reasons about it. In some ways, we've probably dumbed down the gospel a little bit. Uh, you know, we've almost made it so that, you know, for many people today, to be quite honest, you would have looked at Cornelius and go, he's a Christian. Look, he prays, he gives, he knows there's a God, and, you know, done deal, you know, but he's not yet a Christian. He's not yet a Christian. He, he's, he's come close to this. And so throughout church history, they would often describe, you know, talk about this. There's this space where God begins to woo us to him and draw us and it enters into a place where we become a seeker, you know, one who would be, okay, I'm wanting to, you know, I'm wanting to find him and, and you come to that place and that would bring us to that moment of conversion, that moment of being born again. And yet for many people, even in our world, especially because of some of our confusion, just to kind of quickly own it, for some of you, you're like, I'm not sure where that happened. You know, I'm not sure when I, when, I, when I moved from being a seeker to being a follower of Jesus. And again, I've talked to a few of you, and you're like, when we get to heaven, I want God to, like, so when did I actually get saved? You know, like, was it there, 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 or there? I don't know. You know, it could have been one of those. Or maybe just one of those was a place where he was, you know, waking my soul up to, to believe that he's a real God. And, and maybe it happened. And, and God knows that moment. I mean, in many ways, the Bible doesn't call us to try to figure that out. When the Bible talks about an assurance of our salvation and knowing that, it's always a present tense thing. Like, hey, do you know him now? Do you love him now? 
Do you love his word? You walk in his ways. It's like, then you have it. I mean, rarely, I mean, the Bible never tells us, like, you have to figure it out. And again, for some of you, you know. Some of you are like, man, I remember it. Some of you have it on a calendar, and you can say, this is the day. Some of you, again, are just like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I, there was, and especially because, again, maybe someone told you were saved before you were actually saved. You're like, well, see, they said I was. But I wasn't, I don't really know if I encountered that. So again, not to make that too confusing, I hope I didn't just do that. But there is a space of just thinking, okay, there's a place where God can wake up a heart and draw that person to it. But here's the promise that I want you just to kind of just take for a moment. Here's what we know. God says if anybody finds themselves there, they find themselves as a seeker. God says if you'll do it, if you'll be that seeker, you will find me. I mean, if, you, if, you are, if you're in that space, God absolutely promises that he will connect the dots and, and, and make that there. I mean, we think about verses like Jeremiah 29, where it says, and God says, and you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. He says, I will be found by you. Again, he's speaking this to the nation of Israel, but it can communicate something that's communicated in a dozen ways throughout his word. He says, if you'll do it, if you'll seek me, if you'll really seek me, he says, you'll find me. I guarantee you'll find me. I I will be found by you. David would tell his son Solomon the same thing. He says, the Lord searches all hearts and he understands all the intensive thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. I just love that. And I want to just kind of quickly highlight that for a moment because I just want to hold that out as a promise. I want to hold that out in a space of saying, that's one of the great spaces that if somebody's really a seeker and they really are that place of, of a hungry for God, God says, I will make sure to connect that dot. Like he's not going to leave that person, you know, in that space. He's going to draw them into that relationship. And yet I just want to take a moment to speak that. You know, I, I would think about it here, probably for most of you this here this evening, you are followers of Jesus. Like it did happen. Again, maybe you know exactly when, or again, maybe you're one of those is like, I don't know exactly you know, I, I wonder when that happened, when that moment happened, but you're, you're a follower of Jesus today. I just want to say that's a great thing. And it's a good and glorious thing to happen. But I also want to be just very clear. Maybe I'm talking to somebody who is a Cornelius. Maybe you're here this evening and you know there's a God. You're even doing religious things. You come to church. You, you pray, you, you try to do that, but you haven't yet kind of found him. I just want to tell you, hey, don't be satisfied with religion when God is inviting you to a relationship. You know, don't be satisfied with going through the motions when God is inviting you to him. And, and, and just to be that space where we would say, okay, I, I want more than, than just knowing that there is a God. I want to know him. That's what God draws us to. And he absolutely promises to do that. He absolutely promises to do that. Now, again, I know that there's some of tender conscience. I'm not trying to create uh, any confusion, although I'd rather create confusion than leave you ever stopping seeking. So I just want you to see this for a moment. So here's this man who is moral. He, he knows who God, that there is a God. He's praying. He's giving. He's fasting, it's going to tell us in a little bit of a moment. But God's going to bring him all the way in. So a seeker is going to become that. It's one who is in that place where God is drawing. It's fun to watch that, and God still does that. He does that in, in incredible ways. In fact, at this moment, God's going to resp- speak into that, and he's going to become one that responds uh, to God's guidance. So pick it up there in verse 3. This is about the ninth hour of the day. Quick pause. You start that at 6 o'clock in the morning. So the ninth hour of the day is 3 in the afternoon which was one of the Jewish hours of prayer, by the way, so where, where they would pray. And so he's kind of, you know, adopting some of the Jewish customs in the midst of it. But there he is. He says, so about the ninth hour of the day, uh, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up as a memorial before God. Now, send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. 
And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. And when he had explained all these things to him, he sent them to Joppa. So here's the seeker. He's wanting to know God, wanting to know his ways, and, and then God just speaks to him. I mean, supernaturally, incredibly, an angel shows up in a vision. This is a vision. It tells us it is so. God tells him, hey, here's what you need to do. You're going to have to send, get Peter, because you need to hear the truth. And it's a fascinating thing. I don't want to spend a bunch of time on this, but God doesn't, that's, that's the way that God is, is called for the gospel to go forward. He's called us to be those who carry the gospel forward. Even when he works supernaturally, he still will direct them. He did it for Paul. You know, Paul has this incredible encounter, and then he says, hey, you're going to have to go. You know, I'm going to send a man who's going to come and pray for you. And here he's telling Cornelius, hey, you're going to have to, you need to hear the gospel. You're going to, you need to hear it from Peter. He's going to be the one that's going to be there. And so he's directing Peter supernaturally to a space and to a place where he'd hear the truth. I love that. It's worth just noting, God does that. God does that. God will do that. For some of you, it was just that clear. You know, something happened and you just knew, I need to go to that church. <laughs> like God's just telling you, I need to go there. For some of you, it just arranged in a space, but God opens up a door where, where you would do that. And one of the fun things is that for Cornelius, he hears this and he immediately responds. I mean, he hears what God is saying. He immediately does it, you know, as it just tells us there. In verse 7, when the angel spoke to him, departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier, so another man who's kind of influenced in the midst of this, who just waited on him continually, and he explained all these things to him. He sent them to Joppa. When in chapter 11, it is recounted again. It's interesting. Go down to chapter 11 real fast to verse 30. And again, it's just kind of explaining uh, I'm sorry, chapter 10, verse 30, excuse me. In, in the midst of all these things, he, he just looks there and says, as Cornelius is explaining it to him, he says, four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayers have been heard, and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come, he'll tell Peter. Now, therefore, we are all present before God to hear all things commanded you by God. Wow. It's a fun space. In fact, it's kind of interesting to notice how quick Cornelius is to respond. It's going to be kind of a contrast to our next, to, to, to looking at Peter in a moment, that he's going to be a little bit slower, which is funny in its own sense, but still it's worth just kind of looking at this man right now and just loving it. I mean, I don't know about you. I, I love watching this whole thing. I love Cornelius. I love how God's drawing him. I love how, how just thinking about where he was, you know, as a Roman, been brought to believe in God, hungry for God, and now God's going to orchestrate that space for him to get saved, for the, him to hear about Jesus, for him to hear the gospel, and how quick he's just listening to it, how, how, how quick he's responding to it, which is just, it's just a good space. Again, if it's for anybody here to even hear that, just to believe that both for you, but even for others, just to believe that God's doing that. See, the thing that's fun about today in the layers that are today, you know, he's still doing this. In our world today, maybe in our city today, there's probably somebody who's getting, people are getting saved. It tells us in Acts 2, just day by day, people are coming to Christ, those who would be saved. And it's fun to realize how much goes into that story, how much God draws into those spaces, but he's doing that then, he's doing it now. And he's doing things that's drawing people to Christ, drawing people into those spaces. And Cornelius is a good example of watching that happen. Okay, so now we need to flip the story. So we've talked about the big story. We've talked about how Jesus is building his church. We've talked about how Cornelius is being drawn towards salvation, how God's preparing that moment that he's going to hear the gospel and believe. But now we flip over to Peter for a moment and begin to watch God preparing Peter to be involved in that moment, to be in the right space at the right time. It's worth just noting that as it begins here that 
Peter's in Joppa. Hey, go down there to again, verse 5. He says, now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. Pausing there and thinking about it, so we know where it is. It's right there by the sea. It's in then Joppa, which is modern-day Tel Aviv. So if it helps to put it there on a map, Jerusalem down there at the right, you would see Tel Aviv or Joppa right there on the coast. Caesarea is about 31 miles up the coast uh, from uh, Joppa in the midst of that, that's where Cornelius is. Cornelius is with the, with the Roman, uh, you know, just cohort that's there up in Caesarea, leading his hundred men there, and here he's going to send this man. Now, I, I, I point this out just very briefly, but I love this space. In fact, for some of you, you've been to Israel with me. And if you've been to Israel with me, you'll know, most likely, this is where I like to start my Israel trips. We don't always do it. Sometimes just something gets in the way. But most of the time, we land uh, in Ben Gurion, not too far away from Tel Aviv, and we make our way to Joppa. And we make our way to Joppa, and we start there. And, and, and we tell this story because in some ways it's our story. This is the beginning of the gospel going to the Gentile world, which is us, and, and, and how that happens. And yet this story is fascinating because in many ways when we think about this story, it probably is this cool thing that God is weaving in the story, both of what he's doing in this moment, but also the story of Jonah. Well, you probably know the story. All of us probably know the story of Jonah. But one of the interesting things is, is Jonah is called in his generation to take a message to a Gentile world. He's told to take a message then to Nineveh, their enemies, and Jonah's not excited about it. He doesn't, he doesn't want the Ninevites to hear the gospel. He doesn't want to hear them to hear hope. He doesn't want them to hear anything about God. And that's a big story in, in, the, in, the, in the whole account of, of, of the book of Jonah. It tells us there in Jonah chapter 1, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, Gentiles that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. He says, I want you to go there and give a warning to them. Jonah's going to tell us later he didn't want to go because he was afraid that God would be merciful to them, like he would actually, they'd actually respond. He doesn't want them to respond. He doesn't want them to hear any of this. And so God tells Jonah, I want you to go. I want you to go. And in essence, Jonah says no. That's kind of my message that I often begin our Israel trips on. God said go. Jonah says no. God says, hey, I want you to do this. And Jonah, instead of responding and going to Nineveh, Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to, well, note it, Joppa. <laughs> he went down to Joppa, which is where Peter is at this moment. He finds a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare. He went down into it uh, with him to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So there's this cool kind of story that I think God's weaving into the midst of this. I love that God does this, and I think it's fascinating. I hope it's a little bit, you know, fascinating in the midst of this, that God has sovereignly made it so that when we're watching this story of the gospel moving to the end of the world, he arranges for Peter to be in Joppa, which is just kind of funny because in some ways that's this moment. Hey, it's right here. It's right here where Jonah was said no, and Jonah said, no way. Like, like I'm not going. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run away from what God has. And yet right here, God's going to begin to weave a story that's going to invite Peter to not be a Jonah. Hey, don't, 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 don't go that way. Don't, don't fight against me. Don't fight against what I'm doing. Uh, be a part of what I'm doing in this moment, which is kind of that big story of Jesus building his church. And so Peter is in the same place where Jonah is. Again, I just, I love that. The same moment, it's interesting, I don't want to press it too far, but we know he's not just in, this, in the town of Joppa, he's in a tanner's house. That's at least provocative. Provocative how so? Well, he's going to be struggling as a young Jewish boy in a moment as God's going to be calling him to embrace uh, his heart for the world. He's going to struggle with one of those, some of those things, but the Jews would have struggled with a tanner. They would have struggled with, you know, the, 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 the skins, the dead animals, some of the things that would have been there. It would have been something for many of them that they would have found unclean. And it's an interesting thing that Peter's staying there. Why is it interesting? Well, I would just simply put to you that God is doing a work of grace in Peter. He's just 
moving. <laughs> like somehow probably like being at the, at the house of a tanner, it's already a big, big move for him. It's like, I'm actually staying at a tanner. He's probably like, look at me. Like, like I'm doing, I mean, God is really just moving me to be a gracious person. And God's like, you have a lot more far to go. You know, it's like, glad we've come this far. We're going to push you further. We're, we're going to push that, that, that bubble in you more so that you can begin to see it. And so in the midst of it, he's there. And now Peter gets this preparatory vision. Pick it up the, there in verse 9. And the next day, as they went on their journey, so this is Cornelius' servants and a devout soldier, these three men who Cornelius is sending 30 miles up the coast to go get Peter. Peter he is up there in Joppa, and he goes up on a housetop to pray. Often it was in those days. I mean, it's on the housetops, so it would be like a patio area. Uh, you know, that, that kind of worked in the midst of that. So he goes up there in the midst of it, uh, and he's there at the sixth hour. Again, just you already did the math on it, right? So it's six in the morning, this is noon. He's up there at noon. Then he became very hungry, and he wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven opened, and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him and, and let down to the earth. And it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, birds of the air. And the voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And the voice spoke to him again the second time, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. Hey, so there's a bunch in this story, but we're just kind of trying to take a bigger view of it. So I just want you to get this again and see it. This is not real. This isn't really happening. It's a vision. It tells us that. In the midst of the vision, we get the sheet laid down here, and there are unclean animals. That is things that by the Jewish, uh, you know, kind of law, Jews weren't supposed to eat. They weren't supposed to have a part of it, and, and Peter never has. Like, this is never something that he's done before. He's never, you know, eaten these things that are unkosher, uh, unclean. So God just lets the sheet come down, and he says, Peter, I want you to do it. I want you to rise and kill this. And Peter's response, it's been well said, it's not, not original with me. It's a funny response. Not so, Lord. It's a funny thing that in some ways, though he says it, it's words that don't really go together, right? You can't really say Lord and no at the same time. If God is Lord, he's God, which means your response is yes. (laughs) Whatever you say, yes. You know, if you say no, well, then he's not really Lord. You know, he's not really in the midst of it. I think about it. Some of you have it in your little booklet there. I think uh, there, William Graham Scroge said it this way. You can say, Lord, and you can say, not so, but you cannot say, not so, Lord. It's not really possible. Not really. Not authentically. Something's broken. Uh, Something's broken there because you can't really say that together, but that's what he's struggling with. That's what he's struggling with. He's struggling with God commanding him to do something that, he's, that he doesn't feel like he's supposed to do. And so he's, he's arguing with God. He's kind of moving in the midst of this. And God just gives him a, a, a very clear understanding. Hey, if I've cleansed something, it can no longer be considered common. It can no longer be considered unclean. As again, this voice just speaks to him and tells him there uh, again in verse 15. The voice spoke to him again a second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. All this is working. I mean, all this is working in Peter, but maybe one of the things that's fascinating is it takes place three times. Three times? Should that be significant to you or I? It should be. It's so much more to him. I just want you to understand, hey, Peter's story has been an interesting story. And, you know, right there as you get ready to go to the cross, you know, Jesus tells me, tells me, you're going to deny me three times, Peter. Three times it's going to happen. Peter's like, no way. Everybody else is going to fall away. Not going to be me. He does. He denies Jesus. Does it the three times exactly. And then when Jesus meets with Peter later at the Sea of Galilee, three times, Jesus is like, Peter, do you love me? Do you really love me? Then, then I have a plan for you. I have a plan for you. So let's just kind of quickly own it. Three would have been a huge part of Peter's story, and that's not to be missed right now, 
Because God's doing something in Peter to kind of draw him to, to what God has for him, and he's building on the things that God has already taught Peter. Probably already makes sense, but let me just invite you back to see it. Peter has no idea. He has no idea what's happening right now. He does not yet know that there are three men making their way down the coast from Caesarea. He has no idea why he's having this vision. God has not explained it to him yet. God has not told him what he's going to have for him. God is just softening up Peter's heart. God is just preparing Peter so that when God gives him a command, that Peter's going to be willing to respond, and thankfully he's going to be. But I love watching this. Maybe you already kind of understand, maybe if you could see it even in your own life, you would find how faithful God is to do this. God's an amazing God who's at work in our lives. And, and he does things that both draw us to what he has for us, but he'll sometimes put us through circumstances, situations that we didn't even know why it's happening, but they really end up being preparatory. They really end up being things that would shape us and make us so that as God invites us to that next space, uh, that we would kind of get there, and it's an amazing space. He never does it the same way twice, and so again, if you're kind of reading this right now, it's like, well, that didn't happen to me. I never had a vision with a sheet, you know, kind of coming down, you know, if that ever happens, I'll know. God doesn't do it that way. Uh, God doesn't create a one-size-fits-all pattern, but he does do it. He does things in our lives that kind of open up our heart, kind of press us and kind of make us like, are you sure? Like, can you say no, God? I mean, why, why, you're, you know, you know, maybe there's bigotry. Maybe there's, you know, again, you're, you're calling things common that shouldn't be called. Whatever it is, God has a way of, of doing that, which is fascinating, which again kind of draws us to the big story. I mean, we're watching Cornelius get saved. We're watching Peter walk in God's plan. But one of the things I'm just challenging you to see again is it's really God's work. I mean, he's having to work hard to get all of these things in place. And he did it then. He's still doing it now. And maybe part of tonight as we're watching this unpack is, is I just want you to be able to see it and recognize that God would do that in us. Maybe he is right now. Maybe, maybe we're saying something right now and it would be an interesting thing. If you're going through something in your life right now that's preparing you for what he's about to invite you to do, you have no idea what it is. I mean, you have no idea what it is because he doesn't do that. You know, just, but he's just like, hey, you know, I'm working. It's like trying to move you, trying to pull you away in some space and, and grow your life into a space. Our God does that kind of thing. He's doing all of this right now to kind of prepare Peter so Peter would respond, getting his heart ready so that when he speaks, God would answer. Peter would respond. That's exactly what happens. Go back and see it. So again, we get this vision. He, he has this happen three times. The vision's over. Verse 17, now, while Peter wondered within himself what the vision which he had seen meant, which again is just a great place for us to pause. He has no idea. He's like, I don't even know what God's doing. I, just, I, don't, I don't know why this is happening. I don't know why he's showing me these things. He has no idea. He's thinking about it. At that moment, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius, who had made inquiry, for Simon's house, they stood before the gate, and they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. It was just, I mean, great fun timing. God just, Peter's thinking, like, I wonder what this is. Ding dong. You know, it's like, you know, there it is. I mean, right, they're, gonna, they're at the door at the gate. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nations of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and hear words from you. Then he, Peter, invited them in and lodged them. And the next day, Peter went away with them, and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Wow. Hey, let's just put it most simply. God's going to tell Peter to go, and Peter says yes. 
God's going to say, Peter, I want you to go. There's three men here, and you're going to go with them. And Peter invites them in, which all by itself, by the way, is another act of grace, to invite Gentiles to stay with him. That would be, for most Jews, we don't do that. But he is. And, and the next morning, he doesn't, he doesn't wait a day, he doesn't wait a week. He gets up, and, and he's going to make this journey to walk in the things that God has. I love that God meets him. I love that the Holy Spirit just speaks. He says, I want you to, to go with him. I don't want you to doubt anything because I've sent them. I, I, you know, God never does, says something that doesn't need to be said. It's fun that he just, Peter, I know it's going to happen. You're going to, you're, you know, about midnight, you're going, like, what in the world am I doing? It's like, don't doubt. This is me. This is my work. I want you to do this. This is what you're going you're gonna to do. And Peter, he does the opposite of Jonah. God told Jonah, go. And Jonah said, no. God tells Peter, go. And Peter's going to go. He's going to step into this moment. He's going to step into what God has. He's going to be a part uh, of the unfolding story that God is working in this moment. Now, if Peter didn't, God would have used somebody else. I find myself thinking uh, of the words to, to Esther when, you know, our cousin kind of speaks to us and says, hey, you know, if you don't do it, if you don't, if you don't respond, God will get somebody else. But who knows whether you've been put here for such a time as this, like God is moving, he's putting, he's placing you where you are. And it becomes this beautiful place of just being responsive. So we're getting this amazing story. And it's an amazing story of, of the gospel going forward and how it's happening in the book of Acts. And, I, and I've invited you to see it from the three different angles that are laid out there for us this evening. The big story of Jesus building his church, of Cornelius getting saved, and, and, and then Peter's part where, where he would be kind of put into the midst of this. But all of these are overlapping at the same moment, and you're being invited to see it then, but as I could come back to it now and just say, that's the same thing I'm inviting you to see, not just here, but in the book, uh, not just here in the book of Acts, but in our lives as well. And the beautiful thing is God is the one who's faithful. He's the one who's working. He's the one who's doing it. For Cornelius, for Peter, it's just obedience. It's just being instructed and doing and following what God would have for them. And they're going to be a part of the story, the story that's changing the world. And I don't know if that's how you feel your life is. I don't know if you feel like you could read these things and say, hey, that looks like things that God does in us as well. And if you don't see it, I'm going to tell you, well, you're wrong. It's there. There's, there's incredible things that God is doing today. He's building his church today. He's drawing people to Christ. He's leading his people to be in right spaces at right times where they get to walk in the things that God has. And it should just kind of draw us to a space of wanting to step into it. It should draw us to what it looks like. So I kind of want to wind us down there this evening. We'll pick up the story next week. We'll continue kind of the unpacking of these three stories but if I could boil all this down, it might be boiled down to a single word that I'm inviting you to say. And that word is yes. I mean, that word is yes. I mean, to say the opposite of what Peter's, you, you know, say, Lord, yes. <laughs> or whatever that looks like, yes. You know, if that means drawing, if that means working, yes, God, yes to your timing, yes to your ways, yes to what you would have that he would draw us deeper into a relationship with him, that we would be those who seek and find him, yes. That we would be those who say, God, I, I want to be a part of the story, whatever that would look like, whatever you would do in the midst of our world today, that I would say, yes. So maybe I'll just come back and say it. As we, if you've ever been to Israel with us, we stand there overlooking the, the Mediterranean. We stand up on a hill overlooking Joppa often, and we'll just say, here. <laughs> God said, go. Jonah said, no. And it's here where God says, go. Peter says, yes. Reluctantly, slowly, but God got him there. And he invites us to be able to say the same, that we would say, God, yes. Yes to you, yes to what you have, yes to what you'd unpack, yes to where that would go. And you don't have to understand it all. Peter didn't. Cornelius didn't. We just get to look back at it and see stuff that probably they later figured out. And there's probably so much more there, but they didn't have to understand they just had to respond. Respond to what God was doing, where he would lead, what he would unpack in the midst of that. 
It's in fact exactly where he has you and I here this evening. So let's take a few moments. Let's just go before God in prayer. We think about these three stories happening there, these three stories happening now. And let's just say yes to God. Would you join me in prayer? God, I think about your stories. I think about the, the layers that we tried to weave around here this evening, and I don't know how clearly I've made those visible, but it's more clear, and there's more than that. And I love that you're a God who does that. I love the big picture. You're the creator, sustainer, you're the savior. Jesus, I love both the promise and the reality that you would build your church by people believing in you, believing in who you are, coming to the gospel. Thank you that you do that. Thank you that you're still doing that today. I think about those like Cornelius who you rescued from most likely paganism and confusion to space that he recognized that there is a God but you drew them all the way in. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for being a God who has promised to those who would seek you that they would find you. I pray that if there's anybody hearing this in this room tonight or online, that they would stay seeking you, knowing that you're faithful to your promise. But God, we think about that even in our world today. I take hope and confidence that anybody who's really seeking you, they're going to find you. You're going to orchestrate it. You're going to put a believer in their path. You're going to create an opportunity for them to hear the gospel. God, there's not anybody who is seeking you today that you're not working to draw them in. I love that. I love you. I love you. You're doing that. And I love you watching how you did that in Peter. Lord, it's fun to watch that because we can so many ways feel a kinship to him both in his struggles but also hopefully in some of his victories and this was one of them thank you for being gentle thank you for the ways that you prepared Peter for this moment thank you for the vision thank you for the things that softened his heart I would only just bring my life before you and our lives here this evening and say, God, I know you're that gentle. I know you're that faithful, but here we are. Soften us. Tear down the things that would be exalted against you, resisting you. And give us a heart that we would obey. That in many ways, we would just be able to say, yes, Lord. Yes. Yes to what you're doing today. Yes to your timing. Yes to your ways. Yes to what you have. Yes. Guide our steps so that we'd be about what you want us to be about. Yes. God, would you just help that to be real now? Drawing us into a space where yes is exactly what we're saying to you now. And from this evening, we ask that. And we ask it together in Jesus' name. Amen.